My name is James Walker. I'm a Christian apologist, but even though I'm a Christian, I still learn from Atheist Edge. When a claim is falsified by science, it is discarded and put into the trash heap known as bad ideas. When a religious claim is falsified, it somehow becomes metaphor. Instead of them saying, yes, that was wrong, because they can't say that because the Bible is inerrant, they will say, oh, that's just metaphor. Okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of equating that to politics because after QAnon was disproved, QAnon gathered more followers. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, it's so almost I'm, I'm, like... I don't know how that happens. How do you, how do you beat a really bad idea like QAnon, one that we know is <laughs> false. I mean, we know that Hillary Clinton didn't go in the basement of a pizza shop and eat babies' faces. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I said to my mother, I said, do you really think that Tom Hanks drinks raped babies' blood while worshiping <laughs> Satan? Yeah, well, fluoridated water will turn your frogs gay. Yeah, there it is, the gay bomb. Look it up for yourself. I mean, this is what they're... What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. Do you understand that? Ugh, ugh, serious crap. Well, Alex Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus. So, yeah, you're right. It, the more outrageous, the better yes. it'll sell. Uh, well, I mean, come I on. Mean, think about Think about this reptiles from the Sirius star system infiltrating the government donning human guys and taking over the illuminati you think that's funny but there are actually people that believe that that's the funny part that's the crazy part what's the key what what, what what's the key to that to to waking them up yeah, but the, the, the whole thing comes down to and this is true of religion too that the whole thing comes down to whether you want to improve your understanding of what the truth is or whether you want to make believe something else, something you think will be more interesting. When your heart stops beating, you may experience one or more of the following for anywhere between a few seconds to an hour. Lucid thought, difficulty distinguishing between wakefulness and sleep, rapid eye movement, well-structured reasoning, the ability to recall memories, ability, uh, awareness of your current situation, peacefulness, bright light. Death is not a single moment, it is a process. Emergency medical efforts are now able to restart the heart and even reverse this process. Every single phenomenon you experience during the dying process has been thoroughly explained in peer review published scientific journals. Anyone tells you otherwise is lying. Case in point, Alex Malarkey. Yes, that's his real name. The subject of the book, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, claimed he went to heaven, saw angels, and spoke with Jesus. He later admitted this was a lie to get attention. On the process of death, I agree. Death and even life is a process, not a particular point. The uh, uh, Loss of consciousness, whether due to death or illness, is unfortunately something I do uh, have experience seeing. Uh, a loved one of mine suffers a chronic illness, and it sometimes manifests itself in incorrect levels of a simple uh, elemental metabolites. These are simple blood chemistry like sodium, calcium, and magnesium. And when these levels become incorrect in the bloodstream, you will quickly discover the razor's edge of biochemical consciousness that we live with. In order to maintain accurate conscious perceptions and, and rational thought, it's necessary that all of these biochemical processes be fairly well regulated. And death is a massive change in biochemistry. And uh, so uh, you are going to, to experience some uh, unusual perceptions during this point. I'm reminded of something uh, emergency room physicians will say. It's remarkable both how little it takes to kill you and how much it can take to kill you. 
I've told my friend Jim before with the problem of metabolizing my wife once, she did in fact experience religiously based pseudo hallucinations uh, one evening while staying in the hospital. As it turned out, she had downloaded a white noise generator for her phone, which also included Bible verses in the background, making for some uh, very uh, confusing times. Baptism is a ritual of repentance and cleansing oneself of their sins. So, if Jesus was without sin, why did he need to get baptized? A great many scholars and historians agree that the sinless nature of Jesus was a later addition to the Christ take. The only explanation in the Bible is that he needed to get baptized, quote, to fulfill all righteousness, unquote, whatever that means. In John, the most recently written of the Gospels, the story of Jesus' baptism is completely omitted. Apparently, it was far easier to just write the illogical, awkward story right out of existence, or the author of John didn't believe the story mattered enough to include it. Hey, hey you. I am looking for a Mr. David Miscavige. According to these notes here, um, his wife has been missing. Her name is Shelly. Has anybody seen a Miss Shelly Miscavige? We got a police report from Leah Remini back in 2007 when she was asking about Shelly at Tom Cruise's wedding. So why don't you just fess up and let us know where she is? Wait, I have, a, I have an incoming lead. Hold on. Wait, so you're telling me that she has been secluded since 2007 in a Scientology compound in San Bernardino Mountains after a clash with David over her role within the church? Wait, no, nobody's seen or heard of her? No, she hasn't been out? No one has seen her in person? This is very interesting. The Scientology officials state that she's not being held against her will which only belays the psychological influence the Church of Scientology can have over an individual. There has been a few investigative uh, film crews around the compound in the San Bernardino Mountains. Let's check on their footage. Cabbage, hello? If you can see us, please come out. We'd like to talk to you. So do you think they know we're here? Oh yeah, of course they know. There's cameras on every square inch of this place. No, we're Shelly Miscavige. Contact me in relation to the Church of Scientology. I'll say it over and over again. Do your job right. I'll, I'll look forward Don't to saying this honest. Don't give us an answer. If you try, you might get someplace. Let's see it, shall we? Wow. Thank you. As promised, we did contact the Church. Their representative said our request to interview David Miscavige was preposterous. There are two stories of the creation of the universe in the book of Genesis, and they don't agree with each other. So this is, this, this is true, this is true. There are, two, um, there are two accounts of the creation of the universe. Um, chapter one is kind of a self-contained account, and chapter two and three are uh, a separate account. And it, it's it's kind of difficult uh, to see this if you're just looking at it as a uh, as a continuous narrative, right? So if if your assumption is well, you go from chapter one to chapter two, and it, chapter two is just the next thing that happens, then you you kind of fill in the blanks and you say, well, okay, so this must be kind of the rest of the story, and that's that's definitely the way that apologists frame it is that. Well, chapter two, you know, it has all these other details and it's just sort of filling in the gaps because the first one is sort of like a Cliff Snows version. It's like an outline. But the way that the, the, way that the first uh, story, the, the story in chapter one, which uh, biblical scholars uh, say it comes from a completely different literary tradition. So there's, the, uh, there's, there's different literary traditions in the Old Testament that are obvious. Uh, there's the uh, priestly tradition that probably came from the, the priestly caste that was active uh, before, during, after the Babylonian exile, and probably also had a hand in composing the Pentateuch. There's the Yahwist tradition, which is one of the oldest traditions, just a bunch of different stories in which the deity is referred to as Yahweh. There's the Elohist tradition, which is a slightly different set of old stories that refers to the deity as 
uh, Elohim. And then there's the, uh, the Deuteronomic sort of history that um, so sort of tells the story of the origin of the nation of Israel, sort of, you know, sort of how it came together, sort of post-Egyptian uh, uh, exodus, basically. It's, it's sort of after that. Uh, how how everything sort of came together in those first early days, bef even before the monarchy, um, and it, it establishes a the, the Deuteronomic history establishes a specific type of theology that is um, very obvious throughout, um, basically from Deuteronomy all the way to the exile, the idea that um, if you are faithful to Yahweh, to worshiping only Yahweh. Uh, then he will look after you and take care of you and things will be good for your country. And if you are unfaithful to Yahweh, then bad things will happen to your country. And this is definitely an idea that evangelicals have latched on to and uh, try to popularize as best they can in the United States of America. So uh, in chapter one, there's this uh, sort of kind of distinctive account of a creation uh, as a sort of an iterative process where there's a stage, there's like stage one, stage two, stage three, you know, on this day, this happens. And then on the next day, this other thing happens. And it doesn't necessarily make logical sense why certain things happen on certain days. Um, but it's, it's a, um, it's just sort of a progressive unfolding of the universe. So for the, the thing that a lot of people call out is, uh, you know, why is, uh, how is light created before the sun and moon are created, right? So if light is created, what's the source of light? Uh, where does it exist? Where does it come from? Uh, what blocks it? Why, if you, if you have light, why do you even need the sun? Right. And so, <laughs> but it, it's, it's not meant to be a, uh, literal or a scientific account. This is, this is something from deep myth. And it is very likely that it was at the very least influenced by the Babylonian creation myth, uh, which we discovered relatively recently called the Enuma Elish, uh, which also has a creation in different stages where certain things happen, uh, sort of step one, then step two, and then something else is created in the next step, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and even with um, the Babylonians, uh, that, sort of dynamic or that that paradigm of creation goes way beyond before them so it's it's at least as early as the sumerians probably earlier than that um so for the babylonians uh when when they were on the ascendant uh also when they had the hebrews in exile in babylon uh this was the uh sort of the default way of looking at the world this was this was completely tied in with the uh, the different gods and goddesses they had um the uh, the idea that the the world or the matter of the world was in fact created by the um, the separation of waters, right? So in the, in the Babylonian account, you have this sort of water dragon Tiamat, uh, and and she has to be killed, and her body is separated, and and everything in, is made out of her body. Likewise, in Genesis one, what do you have at the very beginning of that account? You have water. And, the, you know, the waters are there at the very beginning of, of the creation and the waters have to be separated, just like the body of Tiamat has to be separated in order to create. Uh, so there's a lot of parallels uh, in between the, the priestly account and the uh, Babylonian account. And that's probably it either came directly from that, the, 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 the priests who were involved in composing this. Uh, for the Hebrew tradition were sort of consciously doing this. They were consciously trying to make a, a Hebrew version of this Babylonian myth for themselves. Or some people have argued that, you know, they were kind of annoyed that this Babylonian version was so popular and, and dominant and they wanted to, they're like, well, look, if it's got to be like this, then we're going to do our own version of this and we're going to put um, Yahweh at the middle of it. Except the priestly version doesn't call the, the deity Yahweh. Actually, the priestly version uses Elohim as well. So uh, take that, what it may be. In the Genesis 2 version, that is a Yahweh's account because that does refer to the deity as Yahweh. And in this account, um, it, there's, not a, um, there's not actually a creation uh, of, of the world from the broken body of, of some entity. 
the world just sort of is. It already is. And um, it, it's kind of like everything just kind of wakes up. And there's, uh, there's plants that are in the ground, but they have to be woken up uh, with the water. And, um, and in this version, instead of, you know, sort of different things being created on different days, everything is just sort of like, you know, pops into existence, except for Adam. So what makes Adam Adam in Genesis 2 and not Genesis 1, because he's not named in Genesis 1, um, in, in Genesis 2, what makes Adam Adam is that he's actually physically molded as if uh, being molded out of clay. And in fact, that's why Adam gets his name. It's Adama, which is clay, red clay. And um, so the idea that, that uh, the God uh, was actually shaping the first human out of some material substance and, and creating him that way instead of just boinking him into, into existence, um, that is distinct from uh, from the uh, from the the Babylonian tradition, and then of course all the everything else sort of gets created, you know, more or less at the same time. There is no there is no progression uh, to the second account. Everything just sort of happens, um, and uh, and and Eve, you know, so just like uh, Adam has to be created out of clay, Eve also has to be created out of something material like she's created out of the the rib that's taken out of adam so that's that happens in that chapter um so there's a <clears throat> there's a materialness to the creation in the second version that you don't really find in the first version the first version things just sort of you know emanate out of uh sort of out of god out, you know they're either popped into existence like i dream of genie or they kind of you know, whoosh into existence in, in the, sort of a magical way. Whereas in, in the second version, the Yahwist version, it's much more um, organic and, and much more like, um, you know, like a, like, like a real thing that's happening with, with, with matter, you know, in the world. The second version is also the one that has the, the serpent and the, um, the fall that all comes from uh, the whole package is is part of the second uh, the Yahwist creation account. So, the um, the creation of Adam and the Garden of Eden and the fall that's all wrapped up in this Yahwist version. It does not really come to us from the priestly version. Now the priests may have thought that this was you know, and then they probably did think it was a, an important story to include. Um, but it just based on the literary analysis, it comes from something much older. So it's not. It's not what they added. What they added was some a different kind of gloss uh, theologically that came to them from this other Mesopotamian tradition that that they most likely inherited from uh, the Babylonian exile. So it's a really interesting thing if you you know if you're reading uh, chapter one versus chapter two, you know, try reading them in in out of order, <laughs> or try just reading chapter two right by itself and and skip chapter one and see if that's not a completely uh, self encapsulated uh, creation account because I think I think it is.